There was a time when Marshall Zelaznik was one of the most powerful people in the UFC. He helped launch the UFC in the United Kingdom. Uh, all the success early on, uh, it was essentially him, Ant Evans, and Michael Bisping doing their thing. And of course, he helped launch UFC Fight Pass, and he did so much in between over a decade uh, with the worldwide leader in mixed martial arts. And now he is headed over to Glory Kickboxing. There was a pit stop in esports, but now it's back in the world of combat sports. He, he tried to leave us, but he is back in, and he is kind enough to be joining us on the phone right now. Marshall, are you there? I am. Hello, Ariel. It's great to talk to you, Marshall. How about this? Congratulations on the big news. Yeah, thank you. It's really uh, exciting to be talking to you again. I, I feel like a fighter who can't hang up the gloves. Uh, That's right. I am back. Yes, because you left the UFC last year and then you go to esports and, and things are great there and you're, you're making big deals, Twitch, millions of dollars, and then, you, and then you get called back. How did this come about? Did they reach out to you? How did this whole thing happen? Yeah, so uh, I met Glory, you'll remember when Fight Pass did the deal to acquire the live rights to the Super Fight series, and then they had that K1 library, we did that deal. So I met some of the board members, um, as well as John Franklin, and we had developed a bit of a relationship as part of that deal. And then after I left the UFC, um, I had a non-compete for a while, so I wasn't really in the market at all. Um, and but nevertheless, Glory would reach out to me to find out if I was interested in um, coming on board. And I would continually tell them that I had a non-compete, which expired in October. And after October, when the non-compete was over, um, I started in earnest discussing with them the possibility of joining their group. As you mentioned, I was at Activision Blizzard with MLG, and we were launching the Overwatch League, which is a pretty cool um, eSport league, city-based franchise with all the big sports owners taking an interest in the league. And it was uh, not an easy decision, I have to tell you. The office uh, where I was at Activision Blizzard was three miles from my house. Um, I had a great group of people I was working with. I became very attached to them, but I've always loved the fight game. I've always been um, really infatuated, frankly, with um, the athletes that compete in combat. And while I've always loved the uh, competition itself, there was something unique about stand-up fighting that I always enjoyed. I was always a boxing fan first. It took me a while to come around to MMA. I became a huge fan while working at the UFC. Um, but there was always something unique about stand-up combat, and Glory offered me this opportunity and to get associated with the greatest stand-up combat league. And my wife and son were, as you know, I always talk about my wife and son, making sure they're okay with this move because I knew it would require a lot of travel and they were okay with it. So I jumped on. Is it fair to say, Marshall, that you're the new sort of face figurehead of glory? I, I've said on the show before that I feel like it's something they've missed. Um, you know, a Scott Coker, a Dana White, every fight promotion kind of has their face. Vince McMahon and WWE. Are you going to be that guy for them? Well, look, it's not a role that I'm, I'm overly comfortable being, but I definitely am going to take on the or take the reins of being the promoter. You'll see me in the media uh, discussing not only the business, but fights. You may remember at the UFC, uh, as we were growing our business internationally, you would see me in front of the media. But I would rarely talk about fights, fighters, matchups, things like that. So in this space, as I get my feet under me and learn our fighters and learn from the great matchmakers and talent that we have or talent scouts that we have at Glory, I'll become more comfortable discussing the fighters because at the end of the day, Art, Ariel, I am a massive fight fan. And I've been watching Glory fights since we acquired them at UFC for Fight Pass. And I'm digging into the archive now. I need to bone up really on sort of the uh, the history and who all the fighters are, but you can expect I'll be out there um, pushing our brand and pushing our sport uh, to even higher levels. Could I ask you about your departure from the UFC, Marshall? Why did you leave that organization? Well, I was asked to leave. Um, no two bones about that. Um, it was obviously the uh, when the company was acquired um, by WME and IMG. IMG has one of the world-renowned um, media groups in terms of distributing media. By the time uh, the acquisition happened, I had 
more, I had taken on more of an exclusive role around our content and media sales and obviously launching Fight Pass. And as soon as it was announced that IMG was going to be the acquirer, if you're someone who was at my level, I was an EVP and chief content officer, I was making a good salary. If you're coming in as a new acquirer and you have the sort of media chops that IMG had, you would look around as an acquirer and say, okay, what do we have that's a redundancy? What can we replace? And so it wasn't a surprise that I was asked um, to leave, uh, but that's in essence what happened. Uh, I think that in the end, IMG's got a really good backbone for media sales. Um, we had never done a deal with IMG when I was at the UFC to take on our distribution rights because we had a team that was managing it. But ultimately, I was asked to go. And how did you feel about that? Did you did you feel betrayed? Did you? I mean, how did you take it? Um, I was anticipating that this would happen. I told the team that was working with me, some really committed, loyal people, that because the IMG was a component of this, that we should all be prepared, um, that we may be asked to leave. So while I wasn't surprised, I think, you know, in the end, no one ever wants to go out that way. I think the one disappointing thing was um, when when the day came and you knew it was coming, it was an awful day for the company. It was terrible. Um, you didn't really get a chance to say goodbye to anybody. You kind of got walked out of the building and that was a little funky to me. I mean, I get it. I understand it's a company and that's how it has to work. And we were lucky. There were a lot of people that gathered together after people were let go that day and we all got together in a nearby bar and hung out. And so I got my chance to say goodbye to people and I'm really lucky because I've stayed in touch with all of them. So yeah, no one ever wants to leave that way, but in the end, with all, with now with hindsight, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. I had a chance to move into esports. I met some incredible people working with a Fortune 500 company. Have I'm certain lifelong contacts there. You know, you may know. I was commuting from LA to Las Vegas every day for the job. I shouldn't say every day, but I would fly on Monday, return home on Friday. My wife and son were here. So that wasn't ideal. I was living this life for about five years of that commuting world. Uh, so in the end, it was, um, I'd probably still be at the UFC if this didn't happen. And I probably would be um, in a not so healthy marriage and not be a great dad. So with all hindsight, I think this was the best thing that ever happened to me. And now I have an opportunity to help grow another combat sport and help it to move the way I feel like I helped the UFC grow. Well, have you, have you kept tabs? Have you been able to watch? I mean, like I said, I, I'm not just blowing smoke up your butt. I mean, you were huge in launching the UK market fight pass. You were, you were, you were a massive part of their success over the past decade. I mean, the reason that company was sold for around 4 billion is, is thanks to people like you. Have you been able to watch or, or, I mean, is it just too fresh or are, are you not ready for that? Now, I always watch, you know, I became a real fan and I have a lot to be thankful for at the UFC. You know, I, um, I saw the world. We not only ran the UK business from London where I was living, but we did every event from Abu Dhabi all the way to Australia into Ireland. And so I was really lucky to be able to be at sort of the tip of the spear as we were growing the business internationally. I do know some of my friends from the UFC who were caught up in the same thing that I was caught up in, who don't watch anymore, who sort of just said, you know what, it hurts too much to watch. But that was never me. I think I watched the first fight back um, after I left. I've always been a fan. Again, I've always loved the athletes. And I have a lot of really good friends at the company. And I root for the company. I honestly do. I, I think that there are amazing things that are still left for the company to do. I think the fighters there are incredible. Um and I think what the UFC was able to do um, shows that there's a real interest in combat sports. And I have no doubt that Glory is going to take its um, part of the stage when it comes to combat and putting on exciting fights. Uh, so could you tell, for the, for the fans that don't know, um, TV is always most important, right? Distribution is most important. Um, what, is, what is the current state of the Glory distribution deals and and specifically i know it's an international brand but we're a north american show so to speak you know like how do you feel about the state of them and, and could you tell us like where could people because i always feel like that's a problem with glory like it's sometimes on espn2 and espn3 and fight pass can you lay it out how do people watch glory and, and how do you feel about their current contracts 
Yeah, so the way to watch in the in North America, really the U.S. for the Glory Number Series, it's a unique structure. The way these events are run, um, they have a preliminary card which gets some exposure on a digital platform called Pluto. Um, but when it comes to sort of the meat of the card, you've got the Glory Super Fight Series, which in UFC or parlance would be sort of the prelims, and then you have the main cards. Uh, but you have the Super Fight Series. That was the deal we did at Fight Pass when I was there. So all around the globe, if you want to watch the Super Fight Series, and we have an event in Chicago coming up um, on February 16th, you'll be able to watch the, uh, the lightweight championship there, our, our lightweight belt fight going on there so that's uh fight pass then you have the numbered event which are more that sound like really the main card now that deal is currently with espn what makes it a little funky and i know why you raised the comment is espn3 which is the digital version of espn will have all of the matches live all the number of matches and then they will replay the matches on espn2 now there are times that espn2 will take the matches live um, we're, we're going to try to get some consistency there so that we can more, um, we can better serve our fans so they know where to watch it. And as far as the characterization or how I character the deals, I think we have work to do on some of the deals. I, I'm really, really committed and understand that 10 years or 11 years ago when I was at the UFC, the space of media was totally different. It was all about television, whether it was pay or free TV, depending on the market. And that's still a huge driver. It still drives a lot of viewership. But we have to be really smart as a company to make sure we're preserving content for the platforms like Amazon and Facebook and Twitch, which you mentioned the deal we did for the Overwatch League. I've built some really good relationships in the last year with a lot of these digital platforms. I think there's a role for them to play. Uh, but I think the team uh, led by John Flank, Franklin and you know Scott Rudman, one of the board members, I think they've done a really good job with our distribution. We're in a lot of countries, uh, but we need to, as they would say in the gaming space, level up some of our deals and level up some of the promotion. So that's what we're going to be focused on. But we're lucky that we've got some good distribution partners and the content is available. Uh, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot here because you're new to the job. Um, but you have thought about it because you, you, as you said, you, you help strike the, the deal with Fight Pass. Why do you think that so many people have tried to launch kickboxing and, and, and sustain it as you know, a, a popular combat sport here in America and all have failed? Now, Glory has had moments and you know, they're, they're still around and that's great. But why do you think that kickboxing has never caught on like MMA and of course like boxing? Well, I think one of the things is, is the at least to a, a North American guy, a guy from the U.S., kickboxing has this um, connotation around it, a perception that people have around the sport. And I think sometimes, and maybe I'm projecting a little bit, that it, it seems like there's a bit of point uh, fighting that's going on, that it almost has an Olympic quality to it. Um, and I think... That is sort of a hangover of some of the fights from back in the day. I think if people take a chance to watch the fights that are happening now, um, this is really, if you will, this is comprised of various stand-up arts. So you've got Muay Thai to traditional kickboxing to karate. Um, any, any martial art where there's a stand-up component is a, um, a genre of fighting that's welcomed at glory. So we, we like to call ourselves a stand-up combat league. Now, the phrase stand-up has taken on a, a certain meaning with the growth of MMA. Uh, you'll hear people describe an MMA fight as a stand-up war or um, even there are times when you have a fight and I've seen them where, you know, you have a guy who's got superior stand-up skills, but he's facing the wrestler and the wrestler gets them down and you hear the crowd start to boo because they know the drama is going to occur if these guys can just stand up and let the stand-up guy get to him. So what we are is we are stand-up combat. So if you're an MMA fan and you like it when the fighters are up banging and standing up, that's basically what you have with glory. You have knees, you have flying knees, you don't have all the clinching. That takes place in MMA. There are opportunities to clinch that have to come with a strip, uh, with a very swift um, strike. You can't continue to hold. So it just makes for nonstop stand-up combat action. And so I think when you think about maybe what the perception of kickboxing is, I think we need to work on getting people to change their perception of what 
quote, kickboxing is and have them understand that this is really just stand up fighting. And, and what you'll learn is when you see the fighters who are competing at this level, that there isn't another fighter in any genre of sport, whether it's MMA or in boxing, who can step in against the world's best uh, kickboxers who are competing in glory and expect to compete well. Um, there is a an art and a style in this fighting, which you'll see the sweet science um, right in front of your face if you watch these guys compete. Just curious, I, I I think that there are some similarities between the world you just left, esports and 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 combat sports, MMA, you know, niche sports, uh, growing exponentially, and and I'm just wondering how difficult it was to leave after you were there for essentially a year. And and someone is asking me this. I wanted to ask you. I know you were you were you were, you were vital in in that last minute deal with Twitch and Overwatch. I do believe uh, another former executive from the UFC, Jamie Pollock, was was instrumental in striking that deal. Why did it take so long? Why did it get to like the last 24, 48 hours to to get that deal done? Well, it was interesting. You know, the um, there was so much demand around Overwatch League, which just for the audience that doesn't know, this is a um, basically a first person shooter game um, that was produced by Blizzard and the company, we developed a league around the game, which was city based leagues. You have a team from New York, a team from Boston, a couple teams from LA, you have um, uh, Shanghai and Seoul. So it's a true global city based league. And there was a lot of interest, you know, what I learned when I got into esports initially was that the ecosystem was very messy. It was really hard to differentiate between different esport or co or competitive matches going on. You couldn't tell what was premier and what wasn't premier. And so in the development of Overwatch League, which had uh, germinated before I got to the company, but I was there as part of the follow through to the sales, uh, there were so many uh, whether they were sponsors or platforms looking for the content who were dying for a product like this. We literally were weighing up a lot of options before we launched. We had our own option, which was MLG has this really um, great video platform that was being built and Twitch is the incumbent. They're the group to go to. They're like the old free to air television network back in the day. Um, and, and what ultimately resulted was the community of Overwatch fans who watched Overwatch were accustomed to watching it on Twitch. And as that deal started to come together, it started to make more and more sense that Twitch was the right partner for us. And while we'd have the content on our platform by also making it available on the Twitch platform was going to make sure the community could access it because it was to your comment, which started this, there are so many similarities in the two. I remember UFC was un, no one in the early days really understood it. There was this perception of brutality of who the athletes were. Um, the media companies didn't know how to deal with it. Like, should I put this on television? Is this not ready for television? Esports has the same thing at a different level. The athletes or the players themselves misunderstood. You know, people think they're one way when it turns out they are a committed, hardworking group, much like what the Ultimate Fighter did for MMA fighters. There's a young male audience that follows esports. Obviously, there's a young male audience that follows combat. Um, the audience is, is rabid. They're very niche, but they're hardcore and they're loyal. So how do you deliver to them? How do you stay authentic to them and then start expanding out to other fan bases? So a lot of similarities. I got recruited. I was actually being recruited to Activision Blizzard while I was at UFC before the hammer dropped. And so I had been speaking with them for a little bit and uh, they saw the similarities with the two sports. So coming back now into combat and with glory, there are a lot of learnings from UFC and a ton of learnings from esports that I feel like I can bring to help us. Wow, it's fascinating. I am fascinated by esports. I have no uh, knowledge of it at all, but it's just amazing to to watch it grow. Last thing for you, Marshall, I appreciate this very much. Just curious, when this news came out, did you happen to hear from either Lorenzo Fertitta or Dana White? Um, I did not. I did reach out to Dana. Dana's still a good friend of mine. Um, I let him know about the news. I let some of the other executives know about the news. Everyone was really congratulatory. I was really, by the way, blown away by the response, whether it was on my, on my um, uh, Twitter or on Facebook. I had so many people reaching out to me to congratulate me and tell me how this is something that I deserve. And I was so, so humbled by it all. I, I really, 
for anyone that reached out to me, thank you. And if I didn't thank you personally, I, I know one day I will. But I did hear from a lot of the people who are still at UFC, and and that makes me feel good. That, that makes me understand that, you know, the reason I left had nothing to do with me as much as it had to do with just a moment in time in the business. And I've always had that confidence anyway, but it's nice to be reaffirmed that that, that yeah. was the situation. Very well deserved. Congratulations. Very happy for you, Marshall. Uh, I won't lie. I'm now going to watch Gloria a, a little closer now because uh, I'm a big fan of yours and, and, and want to see what you're going to do with them. I have no doubt it's going to be great over there. So great move on their part. Um, I, I'm really curious to see how this all plays out. And, and welcome back to Combat Sports. We knew that you wouldn't leave us for good. It's good to have you back. It's not MMA, but it's close enough. I, uh, I wish you nothing but the best over there with Glory. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ariel. I've always been a big fan and I will keep listening. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. There he is, the brand new CEO of Glory Kickboxing, Marshall Zelaznik, a familiar uh, name, face, voice to MMA fans. He has been on the program before. Wish him and Glory nothing but the best. I think it's a great move for them.